Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mudrix. What's up, Jimmy? Tyson, how are you? I am doing all right. Uh, we've are we're on our what fourth episode today, which is good. We're uh, I, I think this is going to be a fun one because the last one was sort of a branding episode. This one's going to be a, a sort of a branding episode. So it's a little bit different, but still, I think it's going to be pretty valuable for our listeners. Well, our guest today is Alexander Watkins from Eat My Words. Alexander, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So this is a fun little topic, and I, I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, tell us, though, before we get into really the nuts and bolts of branding, but tell us about uh, your journey, how you got into branding, and uh, how you got to where you are today. Well, I started my career as an advertising copywriter and worked for big agencies like Ogilvy and Mather. And once in a while, I would get thrown a bone and get to name something. And I love naming, and I was good at it. But I didn't get to do it very often. And then years later, I discovered that naming was actually a profession and it's part of branding where advertising and branding, they don't intersect very often because they're, you know, branding's really in the beginning, advertising is at the end. So when I found out naming was a profession, I quit being a copywriter and told everyone I was going to name things. And people are like, you can't just name things. I'm like, yeah, I can. And of course I did and, you know, have a best-selling book and, and all that. So yeah, I, um, how eat my words, my firm came to be is I was naming a lot of things that make people fat and drunk. And that's where the name eat my words came from. And, uh, my claim to fame is I named the Wendy's Baconator. And I did that as a freelancer for another firm. And that's when I knew like I had to really have my own firm and get my own direct clients instead of working for all these big branding firms and naming agencies. That's so great. Uh, you know, my daughter's name is Noor, N-O-O-R, and I call her the Noornator. So I appreciate the baby. <laughs> pretty awesome. Um, okay, so what does that mean you name things? Like, how does it work? How, what does that even mean? How can someone do that as a full-time profession? Well, companies come to eat my words that need new names for products or companies need a name for or people need a name for their new company. Sometimes a company has a spin-off company or a sub brand uh, and yeah, they just need help. So they complete our creative brief and our team goes to work coming up with a bunch of name ideas for them. So we see a lot of uh, law firms, you know, starting law, uh, their firms, and th they usually just name it after themselves. And you see, you know, names in law firms all the time. I wonder what the qualities are of a good brand name. Well, I, I'm going to tell you, law firms are, are some of our favorite clients to work with because they uh, there's there's nowhere to go but up, right? Because there's so few, uh, because people do name companies after themselves and law firms are, you know, obviously lots of people want their name on the door, partners' names on the door. Um, and I'll tell you really quickly before I tell you about great brand names and the qualities of them, we've named a number of law firms. Um, Bedrock uh, specialized in helping foundation startups build their foundation. And we named um, Terrain, which is does environmental legal. We named uh, a litigation firm in San Francisco uh, Tectonic because they're shaking things up in fringe industries. So those are some, just some of the law firms that we've named. So there's five qualities that make a name great. I have an acronym for this. I have an acronym for the good qualities and the bad qualities. It's, it's uh, SMILE is an acronym for the good ones. SCRATCH is are the seven deadly deal breakers when to scratch it off the list because it makes you scratch your head. So, so the five qualities that make a name great, the SMILE uh, acronym is S stands for suggestive and not suggestive in like a legal term, but that it suggests something about what your brand is or does. So for instance, Amazon suggests enormous. Um, the M in SMILE stands for meaningful. You want your name to be meaningful to your customers, not just to yourself or your engineers. Um, the I stands for imagery. It's really helpful if your name 
when somebody hears it or sees it, can conjure up some imagery because it will make it easier to remember later on. Wait, did I say? I apologize. The M in smile. I changed the. I changed the M. The M used to stand for meaningful. Now it stands for memorable. So memorable. I should know this. I changed it between editions of my book. So yeah, the M stands for memorable, meaning that your name is based on a familiar concept that the people understand, not something foreign. So yeah, I is imagery. The L stands for legs, meaning that your name lends itself to a theme. So for instance, the name Eat My Words lends itself to the theme of food and beverage. So for instance, we have package names like the whole enchilada, and supermarket special uh, that ties into our name. And then the E in smile stands for emotional. You want your name to make an emotional connection with your target audience. And law firm names don't make emotional connections at all if they're just named after the founders because what does your name – really, anytime you name something after yourself, you're, you're giving up a tremendous opportunity – to have a brand that says something about who your firm is and what they do. So um, we recently changed our name. So my last name is Hacking, right? And so mm -hmm. um, a lot of people think that I that our law firm, especially when it was called Hacking Law Practice, that we help people who got charged with hacking crimes, like computer crimes. <laughs> but um, lately, we've been we changed our name to Hacking. We changed our name to Hacking Immigration Law, and we've really started to play around with it because one sort of funny thing is that <clears throat> I have this there, – there's people on the internet who call me the machete because I helped, cut, I helped cut through the red tape at immigration. Like, I didn't make this up. This is just something people call me. And, and so we've been going with that hacking motif, and, and really it, it, it goes well with us because I do – Part of what I do is I sue the government and I do sort of help people hack through this horrible bureaucracy. So we've just started playing around with it, but I'm just wondering what you think about that. Yeah, I think it's great. It's it's so rare that someone has the opportunity that ha that has a last name like yours that could actually play off of it in their business. And I love the the imagery of a machete. And yeah, cutting through the red tape, that's great. And hacking's really fun. Hacking's fun. And you know, law law can be really scary for people. I mean, anytime. Law is scary for people that aren't attorneys. Um, you know, it's it's terrifying. It's pretty terrifying. So anytime that you can take the edge off with a name that's, you know, a little playful or with something that's really visually evocative, like the machete, um, that's fantastic. So you mentioned Scratch. I'm really curious, like, what's what's Scratch stand for? Because I want to hear what uh, what are some of the things we should be looking out for to not do. Okay. Sc scratch, again, if it makes you scratch your head, scratch it off the list. Scratch stands for the S, stands for spelling challenge. That's a really big one. Your name should not look like a typo. Uh, your name should be spelled exactly how it sounds. Super important. Um, you know, just for, you know, don't you hate getting an email bounce back or I'm looking at, yeah, like Tyson, people probably spell your last name wrong, right? I mean, we've all had it, whether it's our first or last name, the street we live on, like nobody wants to get a spelling error. Um, the, the first C in scratch sounds for copycat. Um, as you guys know, being attorneys, um, in trademark law, you can't be a copycat, right? And, you know, we always say, why be somebody else when you can be yourself? Um, and that's more applying to the name, not the legal. <laughs> the legal, that's a little too gentle for the legal, <laughs> for legal. It's like, no, it's more serious than that. Like, you cannot copy somebody else. Um, and then the, <laughs> R in scratch stands for restrictive, and that's when you have a name that kind of boxes you in and doesn't allow for expansion, So, or you just outgrow your name. So, for instance, 24-hour fitness, not all of them are open 24 hours anymore. So that's a restrictive name. Uh, so um, we try to encourage people when they're coming up with their names to 
look in their crystal ball so they don't get locked into a name that doesn't allow for future growth. So really imagine how you might scale in the future. Then the S-C-R-A-T stands for, oh wait, the A stands for annoying. And annoying is, uh, it's subjective, obviously, but I think annoying is, you know, cutesy spellings of names or if your name is ambiguous, you know, nothing about your business should be ambiguous, especially your name. Or if it's a missing vowels, you know, just anything that might annoy or frustrate potential customers, your name should be a welcome mat, not a do not disturb sign, do not enter sign. The T in Scratch stands for tame, and tame names are kind of flat and boring. Um, they can be a little descriptive. Again, we know a big no-no when it comes to trademark law. So we encourage people, don't be a wallflower. If you want to stand out and get noticed, you can't afford to be shy. So don't have a tame name. And then the second C in Scratch stands for Curse of Knowledge. And that is where... You know what your name means, but other people don't. It's often a name that's in a foreign language, uh, which just seems to be a go-to for people. Like, oh, I'll name it, you know, whatever in Swahili. Like, people don't know Swahili or really most other languages. And then finally, and this last one, this next last letter leads, really works with um, Curse of Knowledge as well is the H in Scratch sounds for hard to pronounce. And, you know, a, foreign names are often hard to pronounce. Sur la table, so many people pronounce it sur la table because the word looks like table. Like, why would you not pronounce it table? So there's so many names that people mispronounce because they are in foreign languages that we don't know how to pronounce. And your name should only be pronounced be you know intuitive to pronounce one way um, because if people are pronouncing your name different ways that's going to dilute your brand so that's scratch so when i was listening to you go through scratch i was thinking about all these tech companies that have these sort of cutesy little names where they take out the vowels or they add an extra consonant at the end it just seems so ridiculous to me absolutely that's where the smile and scratch came from i lived in San Francisco for 22 years, and those names made me crazy. Uh, it, it, yeah, and there's so many, there's so much wrong with startup names, and it's, you know, it's all driven by this obsession to have an exact match domain name, like a .com, and you don't have to have an exact match domain. Nobody expects anyone to anymore. I mean, they're all, they're all gone. So, you know, we recommend that people have a modifier, just add, add, like if we weren't eatmywords.com, we would be eat my words branding or eat my words naming, eat my words brand names. That, having a modifier helps with search engine optimization. So it's not a bad thing to have a modifier, but somebody somewhere decided that that is what you had to do, you know, not realizing like, you know, Tesla for the first 13 years wasn't at tesla.com. They were teslamotors.com. Facebook, for you know, was the Facebook up until 2005. Um, you know, Dropbox, Get Dropbox, Basecamp, Basecamp HQ, and all of those companies were willing to forego having an exact match domain name and just you know know that if they wanted, they could purchase it later when they you know had the funds to do so. Or just that they just wouldn't. I mean, Square is still at squareup.com. SlideShare, SlideShare.net. Could, could you talk a little bit about the thought process? In, and I know this is sort of what you do, so this would probably be sort of simplified. But what is the the approach you take in helping people develop what their name should be? Well, we have them complete a creative brief, which is like a roadmap. So, you know, what's the tone and personality they want to communicate in their name? What is the, you know, what's the style of name that they like? Do they like clever names? Like, you know, we named a GPS for dogs, Retriever. 
And we named a Spanish language school Gringo Lingo. That's Gringo Lingo is a more playful name. Um, do they want a more serious, you know, B2B style name? So that's really something to think about. And then the process we do is we never look at domain names in the beginning. We don't look at domain names till the end. And most people start by looking for the domain name. Like, don't worry about the domain name. First, come up with a great brand name. You know, run your trademark screens. You know, do your due diligence with your, you know, trademark research. And then think about the, the domain name. So Jim knows this. Um, not many people do, but we've been talking about changing our firm name. And um, I'm not going to mention what I what we're talking about doing. But um, I worry a little bit about changing midstream because we're about 12 years in and I worry about changing it because we're talking about a, like a dramatic change, like completely changing the name. So I guess what are your thoughts about brands changing their name completely? It's never too late to change your name. We just changed the name of a bank that's more than 100 years old. The bank is a regional, an award-winning regional bank in, in Kansas. It's in Syracuse, Kansas. That's the, the flagship. There's a number of them, but it's called, it was called First National Bank of Syracuse. And, of course, you know, it sounds like a New York bank. And we renamed them Dream First because they wanted an aspirational name that didn't sound like every other bank. So that, that you know, look, a 100-year-old regional bank, you know, which, you know, so much heritage behind it. People that work at the bank have worked there, you know, a quarter of a century. There's people there that work there longer than that. So it was, but they, they knew to be, to kind of keep up with the times, they needed to be more modern. So uh, it's, it's never too late to change your name. And the good thing about changing your name is it's never been easier to do a name change because you can do, you know, domain name redirects. You can send emails out to people to let them know you changed your name. So there's lots of touch points to keep, to let people know that you did the name change where, you know, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have all of that. You know, it's ne it's really never been easier. The hardest thing is, of course, you know, there's never been more names trademarked, but it with law firms, I mean, there's, there's, the, again, that's why we like working with them because there's so many names that aren't trademarked. It's really, really fun for us because it's, it's not the usual, you know, nail biting like process of when we go through trademark screening and things are getting killed left and right. You're listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Our guest today is Alexandra Watkins. She's a naming expert, and we're talking about law firm names. Alexandra, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the importance of not being boring. I say this with all marketing and all aspects of marketing, but when it comes to picking a name, can you talk a little bit about, about being interesting and not boring? Sure. Well, I think like B2B is a great example, right? So B2B, you know, business to business, but I always say B2B shouldn't stand for boring to bland. When you're boring, no one notices you. You are, you are just, you, you fade into the background. But when you have an interesting name, like, you know, hacking immigration, that's an interesting name. And people, I'm sure most people have no idea that's your last name until they know that who you are. Um, it just, it jumps out, right? It's not like every, like if I'm going through names of immigration firms, law firms, and I see hacking immigration, I'm going to immediately be attracted to it. Or, you know, any other names that just, like we named a cupcake store, the Church of Cupcakes. That's an interesting name with great legs. So anytime that you can have a name that starts a conversation, then it's a great name. And a conversation in a good way, not WTF, like, what is that? What does XOBNI mean? Like, but more like, oh, eat my words. What's that? Like, that totally starts a conversation. I so badly want to run our, our proposed firm name by you, run but it by I, me. I'm not you guys, going to. You guys I'll, I'll, I'll call you afterwards. We'll, you we'll chat some Call more. me after, run it by me. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll tell you what I think. And if, if you're, if it's, not working and I'll, I'll be honest and I'll give you some ideas of how you can make it better. Yeah. I, it, yeah. 
It would be my pleasure. I love it. Very cool. That'd be great. You're so awesome. Um, we do need to wrap things up because we're getting close to time. We want to be respectful of your time. Before we wrap things up, though, will you tell people how to get in touch with you if they want to work with you? Sure. I'm at eatmywords.com or Alexandra at eatmywords.com. There's no I in my name. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I have a tip, too, if you need a tip. Ready? Oh, it's okay. coming. Yeah, I will, we'll get that in just oh, a moment. Oh, nope. okay. Hold yeah. on to it for okay, just a second. To get in touch and we'll, with me. Uh, I'll ask you for it. Yeah. Okay. And connect with me on LinkedIn too. And if you're a trademark attorney Thank you so and much. you want my book, j just shoot me an email. We do have uh, in the guild, we have uh, multiple trademark attorneys. So that's, that's awesome. So very cool. Um, well, yeah. All right, we're going to wrap things up yeah. before I do. I want to remind everyone to join us in the big Facebook group. Uh, and if you want a more high level conversation, join us in the guild, go to maxlawguild.com. And while you're listening to the rest of this episode, if you don't mind giving us a five star review, we would greatly appreciate it. Jimmy, what's your hack of the week? Speaking of LinkedIn, my hack of the week is to post regularly in LinkedIn. We've started about six weeks ago. And maybe eight weeks ago, we post every single business day, so Monday through Friday, and we're getting tons of great engagement. And the surprising benefit that's really come out of it is the awesome resumes that we've gotten. So, you know, I always take a position with immigration. I always am happy to stick it in the eye of immigration, and I like talking about our lawsuits and all that stuff. That resonates with certain people, and it resonates with the kinds of lawyers and paralegals that we want to work here. So... The one thing that's been really surprising about our commitment to uh, posting in LinkedIn more often isn't so much the connections that we've made, and we've made great connections, and our number of followers are up like 1,300 people in six weeks. Um, but the bigger thing is the actual resumes we're getting unsolicited from people who want to come work for us. So um, it's, it's not something I anticipated from LinkedIn, but certainly something we're happy about. Nice. I, I can't stand going, going on to LinkedIn, but I hear that there's a lot of value in it. So we do a little bit of posting, but I, we need to up our game. So that's a good reminder, Jimmy. Um, Alexander. So we, this is where we always ask our guests to give a tip or a hack of the week. Yeah. If you got a tip for us, so fire it away. Yes, I do. But I'm going to say that the name hacking immigration as the name of your firm is also attracting people that want to work for you. I am sure of it. I am a hundred percent sure that's, that sounds like a cool place to work. Um, my tip is to, if you want to test your name, uh, you can run it through the Smile and Scratch test. Just go to eatmywords.com and click on, I think it's like check my name or check a name or, yeah, um, test, test my name. Yeah, free test. It will ask you 12 questions about your name and give you tips along the way. Very, very cool. Um, I actually think that I was on this before. Uh, so I, I actually think I sent this to Becca and Jim, I, if I remember correctly. So that's very cool. Uh, awesome stuff. So for my tip of the week, I, um, I, I got this from Jim Hacking. Um, my is to, instead of drinking like out of like a Starbucks cup while you're like recording videos, cause we're all recording videos these days. Get a nice little bland cup and put whatever you want in it. I've got water in this and it just – Jim's got a – he's got a Darth Vader cup. But instead of like using like a Starbucks cup or something, you know, that's uh, – that can maybe trigger people, you like go with like something bland. I'm doing a nice little white, you know, ceramic cup with nothing on it. So – and I think it's – I think it's actually pretty good, Jim. I think it's a good tip. So thanks for that. Uh, Alexandra, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. And I can't wait to, to run this name by you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reach out to you offline. Sounds good. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Alexandra. Have a wonderful day. Appreciate it.